Good morning. If you see something shoot out of my mouth while I'm preaching, it's just a cough drop, no worries. Uh, hopefully this week you've had an opportunity to use some of our resources. Uh, Aaron sent out an email last Sunday that talked about different ways you can connect as we're spending some time in John. So uh, we, we have scripture journals. If you haven't taken one, <clears throat> please do. Or if you really feel like maybe you and your spouse will really use both of them, take another so you can each have one. They're, they're pretty inexpensive. Uh, I actually use them all the time when I'm studying because it's very helpful to write out my thoughts and, and plan through what I'm thinking and, and just to really hear the Lord speak. Uh, it's a great, really a great resource to have. Uh, they have scripture journals for every book of the Bible, uh, and it's a great way. I don't like writing in my Bible because when I'm teaching, it's a distraction. I'm like, ooh, why did I write this note? Uh, so, But I encourage you uh, to use these opportunities to really connect in various ways, whether it's there's a podcast in there that you can listen to that was done by a church several years ago that just walks through the book of John as well. They're not going to match up with what we're doing, but it will give you an opportunity to have more time connecting to the Word. Uh, have conversations with your kids at home. Do do whatever it takes to really engage this time together. The, the reason behind going through and studying Scripture together like this is this is how it was designed from the beginning. The nation of Israel got together and they would read the Scripture aloud and everyone would sit and listen to it and they would memorize it and celebrate it and, and worship God through it. And so we want to make sure this time is a time to do that. Uh, we're going to just continue on this morning. And I, I love what John does here. Oftentimes, the first 18 verses of John are kind of just preached together. The prologue, the here is who Jesus is. But the reason I took a break is because I, I wanted to show you the gap there. The first five verses are an introduction to the cosmic entity that is Jesus. The creator God that powerfully spoke into existence all the planets, all of the solar systems, all the, of existence was brought to life by God's own word, Jesus. And so we, we get to meet this creator God who cosmically sits above us and rules over us and created us and knit us together in our mother's rooms. He is at the work of his hands we are made, and here we are. But there is oftentimes in the, throughout the history of the world, gods have always been seen as this entity that is unreachable. Oh yeah, God created us, but then he's distant, impersonal, doesn't exist, doesn't have a relationship with us. And so John starts there with this cosmic God. And he begins to describe some of who Jesus is, and he talks about light and darkness and life, because this God has power over life and death. And he has the ability to bring darkness into every corner of this world. And so there's this moment that we meet this infinitely powerful God that seems often distant. And then there's this weird transition in verse 6. You're, you're seeing all of this who God is and what he's doing, and then John like breaks and starts talking about some guy. So let me, let's read that together. Verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came bear witness about the light. So now we have this infinite, amazing creator who is light and life. And now we have this simple man named John. Now, it's not the author of the book. This is John the Baptist he's talking about. And we have this shift from the cosmic powers of our creator to some man. And John is very intentional about doing this. He's saying, listen, God 
laid out the foundations of creation. He made everything. And now he has sent a man. And in sending this man, this man's job was designed by God to be a witness. And we're going to talk about what that means. But John was directed and set up and birthed for this role. Jesus, the creator of all things, was coming into this world to serve his role. His role that he was willingly able and capable of submitting to. And so John is drawing this this beautiful picture of saying, listen, you have this God that seems infinitely powerful and way out of your reach. And yet this God has workings in our everyday lives. And so in his workings, he sent one man named John. And he sent him to testify or witness about the light. Now we know John's story. He was a little crazy, it seems. Right? He dressed funny. He ate weird things. Uh, he lived out in the wilderness. I think we are the crazy ones. Because he was so sold out on what God had sent him to do that he didn't care about anything else. He said, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to wear the simplest clothes. I'm going to eat bugs because I can just pick them up off the ground. And all I'm going to do is preach and teach about the light. And I'm going to tell everyone that comes who this light is and what he is coming to do. And so this was God's plan for John. John, you're going to be a witness, and you're going to bear my name. The same words are used for Jesus, that he is coming, that he was called by God to come to earth. John was called by God to be a witness. And so John is drawing these parallels so that we can see that the cosmic entity of Jesus is at work in the simplicity of each individual life is coming to do his work, but yet at the same time, he is very personal. There's often, I think, a hardship in our lives as we try to understand God. He feels so very distant. Or we get into a pattern and say, this is, of course I have a relationship with God, and it just becomes this natural part of life that we don't see the beauty and the depth and the majesty of who God really is. And we wake up and we say a little prayer and we go about our day and, you know, we we thank God at our meals and we maybe pray at night before we go to bed and and it becomes routine. And we miss out on God's majesty or we miss out on our stories too. The implications for who John was and the expectations he had was very simple. John called people to make a decision. A decision that every single human being on the face of this earth must make. What are you going to do with Jesus? That's your decision. And decisions are hard, right? How many of you love making decisions? Show of hands. Anyone likes making decisions? Now, if you raised your hand, do you like making decisions or Do you like controlling the situations? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Ah, I hate making decisions. I have to make decisions all the time, but I don't like doing it. Why? Because there's so much weight and pressure. And what if this happens when I make this decision? Or what if what this, and that's the hard thing about decisions. But now we have a decision we have to make. And John is coming in and saying, hey, listen. If you want light, if you want life, this is the only way to get it. Jesus. What are you going to do with him? And there's no half ways with Jesus. This isn't a, ah, I want to take a little bit of Jesus. Because I I want the heaven part of Jesus. I want to spend eternity in paradise. That would be great. 
right? I want that piece of Jesus. What about the piece that God ordained your life and knitted you together and planned things for you? The title witness isn't just John's title. If you believe in Jesus, it's your title too. So a deci- this is a big decision. It's, it, it carries weight in our lives. And John's saying, listen, this is who the creator is. He is light come into the world, revealing truth. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about Jesus? Cosmic creator Jesus. Here is who he is. Now what? So John continues, verse 9. The true light, right? John John was not the light. People thought he was, right? People, all kinds of people gathered, thousands, followed a crazy man in the wilderness wearing camel hair and eating locusts covered in honey, right? That's, and to follow him, you got to be a little crazy yourself, I think, right? So something John was saying was hitting people's hearts. But oftentimes when they were following John, they were like, oh, I want what you got. He's like, no, you don't want me. You want this guy. I'm preparing the way for Jesus. So the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. All right, so here it comes. The light is coming into the world. And this is John's message. It's not me, guys. It's him. Look for him. That was... The reality of John's job. The reality of John's job was to get out of the way so people could see Jesus. And so he wanted to, he wanted to look at this picture of now our cosmic ruling creator God, infinitely powerful, infinitely wise, all-knowing, is coming. But yet, the world did not receive him. And I love this picture because I I think it's twofold to to show you what the book of John is going to look like. The majority of the book, the first like 13, 14 chapters are about how people rejected Jesus. Here's who Jesus is and it's constant rejection over and over again of we don't want this. Ooh, that looks really good. Ah, that was a little too much for us, Jesus. So, so, John a little is giving us a picture of what the book is going to look like where there is this constant battle of people Jesus being in their midst saying I'm with you I've come for you I want you ah, we don't want that but then there's this picture of the history of the entirety of the world where God in creating his world and his people chose one specific group And he says, you're going to be my people. And over and over again, what did he do to them? He spoke. He gave them a word. A word of salvation, a word of of his grace and his glory, a word of his mercy, a, a word of his deliverance. And he constantly spoke over and over again to his people. He presented it to himself over and over to them. Jesus was present all throughout the Old Testament. And we have instances where we believe that Jesus was physically present whether it's wrestling with Jacob on the road or standing in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there is there are times where we believe that Jesus was present on earth and no one realized it. But the word of God, even though at times it was received by God's people, it was almost often immediately rejected. Watch, read the Old Testament, and you'll see these huge mountain moments where God is present, and then all of a sudden the people turn real dumb. They go, Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law. To, to receive, hey, this is how I want you to live. And what do the people do? They're like, hey, you know what would be good? We'd like to go worship those cows again. 
Like, can you imagine? Like, I think miracles happen all the time. But the miracles in the Old Testament, if those things start happening, we got to start going, okay, something weird going on here. They are standing under a mountain with the glory of God over the top of it. Who knows what kind of explosions and rocking of the weather was going on up there that you could see a visual picture of an invisible God present talking to your leader and your decision is like, ah, oh, man, he's taking too long. So, like, could you give us something else to do down here? Now, we laugh at that, but how often do we do that? Like, we're like, God, could you just show up in mighty ways and, and do all these incredible moments and, and just take care of all my needs? And, man, my neighbor needs Jesus, and, and I, I need you to show up and go talk to him. And God's like, hey, dude, you're a witness. Why don't, why don't you go to your neighbor? Because I sent you, and, I, and I've come for you, and I've given you light so you can be light in the darkness. And then we're like, what? Well, I went this mountaintop moment. And so John is testifying to the fact that when God showed up, when Jesus was in the world, the world did not receive him. It is natural in our sinful nature to reject God in his work. The world did not know him. There were often times throughout the Old Testament, that Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit would declare the power of God and people would just miss it. God's people. Why? Sometimes we know, sometimes we don't understand. You know, moments of great majesty where God pours out his power, you're like, that's obvious. How are you, how are you missing that? Imagine living through the Exodus and seeing all that craziness happen in Egypt. You get across a sea that was impassable. You get on the other side, and then you're like, ah, oh, we're hungry and thirsty. Where's our stuff, God? And you're like, how do you get from this moment where God provided all of this craziness, freed you from hundreds of years of slavery, and then you're like, oh, what about now? It's turned out of dust. Hundreds of years or weeks, months, years of slavery to sin. And we come into a relationship with Jesus and he frees us from that. And then immediately out of the, that salvation, we're like, oh God, why aren't you doing all these things in my life? We're missing out. We don't see the beauty of who Jesus is unless we can know him more and more. The purpose of the book of John is to know Christ so you can believe. But the world did not know him. He came to his own people. Jesus' day. His people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him. This is important. Here's a quick instance of the gospel message. Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about a little theological pet peeve here, okay? You might have done this. I'm not trying to attack you, all right? It's okay. It happens. Sometimes we say things we think Scripture says, but we're wrong, all right? So I want to the theologically do a little correcting here if you've ever done this. There are oftentimes Christians do this to try to kind of bridge gaps between their neighbors or their friends or their family. And they're trying to help them with whatever struggles or life things are going on. And they sit down with them and they say, hey, listen, it's all right. We're on the same page. We're all children of God. We are not all children of God. All right? We are all creations of God. All right, God made us. Colossians is very clear about that. We are all image bearers of God. Genesis 1, 2. All right, we are we are created in the image of our our heavenly Father. But when we sin, we are separated from God. 
And so to become a child of God means that God adopts us into his family. He says, I I am choosing you. And I am pulling you into my blessings and my mercy and my grace. The requirement is belief in Jesus. A believing that he died on the cross for our sins. A believing that he shed his blood to cover them. A believing that he rose from the dead. A repentance, a confession of our sins. Right? That, that is what our job is. Because it, it makes it very clear. When we become children of God, it's not because we were born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Nothing we can do can get us into God's family. Nothing. But the blood of Jesus can. And so now we have this cosmic entity and this man witnessing about him saying, listen, he's here. Like all of these things that we have been thinking are good, all of these miracles that you've heard about your entirety of your life that our people have experienced, the freedom from captivity, the freedom from slavery, the freedom from all of these bondage things that our people have experienced over generation after generation, all those promises that all the prophets made, that promise has come true in this one man here. The light has come and the darkness is going to flee, but we have to believe and trust in him. But be weary because often his people will reject him and miss him. And so what an honor it is to be adopted into God's family and given the title children of God. What's that mean? That means you get the inheritance. That means you get the blessings. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. But what does that look like? Cosmic creator, what do we do with him? What's, what's John fully declaring? Let's, let's finish the passage here. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, For this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is the Father's side. He has made him known. All right, so we have all this information, right? Make a decision. What are you going to do with Jesus? So we have the infinite, powerful, creator God, cosmic entity who can speak into existence planets, who is now taking on flesh. The incarnate. Jesus gave up his throne in heaven, became flesh like us to present God to us in a way that we would finally understand and to offer his life up so that we could have life. This is a big deal. All right, we, we go back to the understanding that at this time, all of the gods of the world were these distant beings. I mean, they're not real, so that's probably why they're distant, but, right, they're distant. They only show up when you do the right things. You got to do X, Y, or Z, and then the blessings will come. I was in Taiwan many years ago. Uh, my wife and I were on a, part of a missions trip there, and we were in there. And one of the things that I was told 
we were told not to do uh, is go into the temples because there's temples all over the place in Taiwan. They're beautiful, ornate buildings. You'll come into a, a little tiny village that can't afford to like house all their people or everything is kind of falling apart. And then you'll have this massive ornate temple. And one of the things I was told is don't, don't go in the temple. And sadly enough, I'm a very curious person. So he tell me not to do something. I'm like, eh, but I kind of want to do it. So I was like, why not? Why are we going in there? And I was, and it wasn't disrespectful or anything to walk in there or anything. But what they did was the people would uh, come to the temple and they would want a blessing for whatever it may be. Maybe it's a prayer over, there's a lot of ancestry worship in Asia culture. Uh, maybe it's pray for dead family members or it was a blessing for their own lives. It, it could be a lot of different things. But they would go in there and they would buy paper money. They would use paper money to buy fake paper money, all right? And then they would take it to wherever the offering place was, and then they would burn it. Uh, and depending on how much money they paid, they could draw out so many blessings. And, uh, you know, we, I, th I think we kind of hear that as a modern day person go, that's crazy. And then we, you walk by a casino and you take in real money and you get fake money and you put it in the machine and you hope for some blessings and you realize, ooh, this is a problem, all right? So, but they were these ornate temples, and this is what they did. They would, they would, I mean, these villages would be broken and run down, and like they would because they would throw all their money at these elaborate temples. But anyway, so I, ah, uh, we were waiting for lunch because they were catching it out of the ocean, uh, and I was like, we, everyone was kind of off doing stuff, and I was like, I'm gonna go walk into this temple. It was the most oppressive thing I felt in my life. Like just spiritual pressure the second I put my foot inside of there. Of like Satan or, or, or his demons or something saying, this is not your place. And I was like, oh. I mean, I could feel like it was like I couldn't breathe. And I just started praying and started being like, oh, I think I probably shouldn't have been in here. Uh, but it, but it, was the, it was the presence of the Holy Spirit that was like, Stephen, you're okay. I got you. But there are places in our world that, that miss out on the presence of God. And, and we in our Western culture miss out because we often think of God as like this, this beautiful, loving Father who takes care of us that we somewhat do what he's supposed to do. And we miss out on the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It's beautiful. You're going to go, you know, you're going to go to Liberia and you're probably going to deal with things that we don't often think about or consider. And why that is, I don't know, but we miss out on who Jesus is. And so what Jesus comes into the flesh, he comes to show us how real God is. And he shows us what it's like to live as a human. And he shows us how we can have a relationship with the Father. And he does all of these things as a fleshly human being. This almighty, powerful God that didn't have to create any of us, who loves us so much, he did so. And he still continues to pursue us in our faults and our brokenness and mainly our sins. And he comes and he shows up and he says, listen, you got to make a decision about me, but I want that decision to be good because I want what is good for you. And so the flesh shows up in all of his glory and all of his majesty, and it points to grace and truth, which is a hard bound. Those words are not separated, all right? Okay? Some of you, if you're like me, tend to be truth people. This is what God's word says, live it. It's that simple, right? Okay? They're not separated, they're not separated ideas, grace and truth. If we go too hard into truth, it doesn't mean we compromise truth, but if we go too hard into truth, we lose grace. God is a God of grace and truth. So how do we, how do we love our neighbors by showing them both? And we, we marry those together that Jesus did when he came fleshly and said, I'm going to show you God's grace and truth. Some of you may be like, I'm all grace. Often all grace is... I'll say it's the like worst way to end up because you you start doing things that aren't God's truth at all. And so 
So Jesus came to explain it to us and show it to us and say, okay, this is what God's grace and truth, because it's evident all throughout the Old Testament. It's evident in our lives today, but just like the Old Testament, just like God's people throughout history, is we have ups and downs. God, God is present. He shows us something incredible. And then the next day we're like, ah, we forgot all about that. And so Jesus shows up in our midst and he's full of grace and truth. And John the Baptist's response to this is like, hey, this is the guy. Man, you guys have been following me. You've been watching me do weird things. You've, you've been, you're so excited about this coming of the light, this, this Savior. He's here. He is here. I mean, you even have disciples who are like, ah, should we go? We want, kind of want to go follow him, John. Can we go follow him? And John's like, of course. Like, what are you doing? Like, are we like that? Are we like that with Jesus that we're so excited about his presence? We so realize who he is that we're like, hey, I want to just tell you about Jesus. And I want to tell you about what he's done and what he continues to do. For from his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. So there, you, you know this, right? You know the Old Testament. You know all the laws. Those laws were meant to point to a future salvation, right? They were partially meant to say you can never live up to the requirements that God has for holiness, to be in the presence of God, you must be holy. And in order to be holy, you must be able to live up to these 400 and some laws. I don't remember the number. I'll top my head at this moment. All right? And we think about that, and we think about the just the 10. Because most of us probably remember the 10. And you start thinking about the 10, and you realize, oh, wow, that was a really small list, and I already messed that one up. And now, the interesting part is when Jesus talks to some of the, the religious leaders and they're like, oh, well, we follow the 10. And he, Jesus is like, yeah, but do you? If you hate your brother, it's equivalent to murdering him. Oh. See, Jesus has come to reveal the fullness of the law. And to show us what it looks like to be in God's holiness. We can't get there. We can't be children of God. We can't do that of our own will. We can't fulfill the law. But yet Jesus comes to offer grace and truth and to present the Father and the Holy Spirit to us in a way that we can know deeply. So he shows up in the book of John. We're going to walk through all the things that Jesus does, and it's going to, hopefully, there is a sense of, in our spirit, of like, I want to know, I want to know Jesus well. And so we're going to dig into it together and we're going to try to understand it and we're going to realize that our picture of Jesus is often small and it will grow the more we are in Scripture. This is God speaking to us. All right? No one else. Lots of good books out there. I saw, I saw a video the other day. My YouTube feed is full of weird things. Uh, it, it, it just is. I like to go down weird rabbit holes uh, when I'm studying uh, when I'm just bored or whatever, it's not necessarily a great thing. Uh, but I came across this video, and it was it was a I'm assuming he was a pastor from somewhere uh, who had a translation of the Bible that I'm not going to mention because my I think it's a fine translation. Uh, but he said I can correct the original Greek with my translation of the Bible. And I was like, what? Say what? Like, but no. The originals, those are God's words. Those are God's words. And it speaks to us and it, and, it, and it lets us know. Like, I think God speaks to us in many ways. 
I think God audibly speaks to some. Right? We see it all throughout Scripture. I think it happens today. I think God speaks through us as the church. This is why you need to be engaged with the church. Come to come for more. Join a small group. Uh, come hang out with me I, in my office. It's fine. We can talk about stuff. Uh, we can organize it. We can do all kinds of things. All right? Uh, it, it's that ironing, sharpening iron moment. The church is meant to gather together, and sometimes we have to gently, gracefully, and truthfully correct each other and help guide each other. Right? That God speaks through one another. He speaks through his word. He speaks loud and clear through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, have to, we have to learn to discern the comforter that Jesus has left with us and discern how as he speaks. All right, This is not Jiminy Cricket, right? This, the Holy Spirit is not Jiminy Cricket. I think it's the picture. We often, if you don't know what Jiminy Cricket is, you're not old enough, I guess. Uh, but he doesn't, the Holy Spirit doesn't sit on our shoulder and tell us, oh, you, like, frankly, Jiminy Cricket, had Pinocchio do some bad things. So it it's one of it, that the Holy Spirit is always going to reach out for our good and he speaks to us. But again, in, in our kind of Western culture, we often ignore that because we're not in the spiritual. We don't think of God. God is spirit. We don't think of that that way. And so the more intimate we get in a relationship with Jesus and, and we use all of the things that, that he has created and crafted to draw us into the Father, the more we begin to grow. And it's like we talked about last week. The bigger, Jesus will become bigger and bigger and bigger to us the more we know him. And it, I can guarantee that you will never know Jesus enough to realize the depth of how big he is. And so this is the point of John is saying, listen, the creator God who spoke into existence, cosmos, has come down physically into your midst, and he wants you. This is what it looks like to come into a relationship with him and know the Father and know the Holy Spirit and know all of his grace and truth. So what do we, what do, we do with this? Uh, I wrote this in your bulletin. I, I can't remember if I wrote it. It's backwards or whatever, but there are three titles in there. We're going to work backwards from the end of this passage up. So I think that's actually the order they're in. Uh, you don't need to write notes. If you like writing notes, I recommend it. But, but this is the three titles. Incarnate. It starts there. It doesn't start with us. Right? We, we like to think the world revolves around humans in like many, many different ways. Oh, if we just change the way we do all these things, we'll fix the world. No, if we surrender to Jesus, we'll fix the world. Well, he'll fix the world. We'll, we'll just get to come along for the ride. So, so the incarnate. God himself stepping out of heaven. Jesus, the son. We get to become children of God. Jesus is the son. And he comes and becomes flesh. And he invites us into an intimate relationship with him so that we can have access to God. So in order for us to know God, to know his will, to know his desires, to know why he created us, we must first know the incarnation, Jesus Christ. And in doing so, in believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead, in repenting of our sins, Jesus becomes Lord of our lives and we gain a new title, children of God. An invitation into a relationship like no other. The promises that God has given to his people since creation are given to his children. Promises of blessings and promises of an eternity with the Father in the Son and the Holy Spirit forever. Like, I don't think we can imagine, I think time is a hard concept for us to wrap our minds around. We're like, oh, I get the days and I get the years. I've, you know, I've lived it this long. I can understand that. But to imagine, I want you to imagine the greatest day of your life. All right, whatever you may think that is, it doesn't matter if that's actually the greatest day of your life. Uh, the greatest day of your life probably, to be honest with you, is the day that you 
start a relationship with Jesus. That's just let's just be honest about that. But maybe you don't imagine it that way. That's okay. You're wrong, but it's okay. All right. Imagine the greatest day of your life. And that thing is the worst day in comparison to the beauty of an eternity in the presence of our holy God. No more tears. No more pain. No more suffering. No more brokenness. No more sin. No more decisions because we don't have to make any because we're in God's presence and we can just worship him. That's what it means to be children of God. It's a salvation that is present and active right now in our lives that ultimately ends in a future salvation in God's glory. Title that we should carry well. And if we're going to carry it well, it's important that we also understand the third title. When we become children of God, we have a job to do. Why not share the greatest thing you have with everyone you possibly can? Like John, we are called to be witnesses. What does that mean? We got to be able to tell people about Jesus. I want you to think about the thing you know most about in this world. Maybe you're an expert in some field. I have no expertise other than I, I know a lot about Jesus. That's like, I, I don't know about, a lot about anything else. I don't have the brain capacity for it. I forget things all the time. I just can't remember it. Sometimes my kids will tell me stuff, and I'll be like, it's great. I'm sure I knew that at one point in my life. So I want you to think about the thing you're most knowledgeable about, right? Think about how you can explain that to someone. You can teach them. You can share that with them. You can, oh, I really, all right, let's, let's turn it into Wisconsin, right? I don't know how many in this room of you can fish, but it's probably a lot. My kids got to go fishing for the second time in their life the other day with Scott. And Micah got to catch his first two fish ever. All right? It was a pretty exciting moment. And Scott was teaching them. And while Scott's teaching them, I'm learning things because I don't know how to fish either. And uh, it, it's, it's incredible, right? Scott, Scott's very simply just telling my kids how to fish. And he's giving them rods that I'm like, I don't even know how to cast this. Like you're, And he's teaching me and I'm watching I'm watching Micah come over and he is holding the line correctly just like Scott had told him and he's he's firing it out into the water uh, just like Scott has told him and it doesn't go super far but I was like oh he's he's learning this there were other struggles while we were fishing but there he's learning this Scott is telling my kid something that he knows he's witnessing him about fishing he knows fishing he fishes a lot he loves fishing because he likes to eat fish I don't know why, but that's, you know, he does. So what do we do? We intimately dive into Jesus and we study our scriptures and we gather together with other people who are going to speak into our lives and then we witness about it. And let me tell you about what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you about what I know about Jesus. Now, this is important where we balance grace and truth. All right? You might understand that something is a sin. You, you very clearly see it in Scripture. Your neighbor doesn't need to hear that they're sinning. They need to hear about the grace of Jesus. They know they're sinning. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict them of that, not us. Now, as we're journeying together, we talk about discipleship. There are going to be moments where you're here and you're starting and you're like, okay, let's just form an understanding of who Jesus is. And then you're going to get way over here in the deep stuff. And there are going to be times where... The, uh, Sorry about my crudeness here, but uh, you need a kick in the pants because you're not doing what you know should be doing. All right? There, th this is a drastic difference, though, right? We are witnessing those who don't know the beauty and the love and the grace of the God who came to dwell with them. And so we're telling them about that and about our experience. We're witnesses to the truth of God's love. And as we journey with them, right, our, our method is discipleship. Discipleship is just being imitators of Christ and teaching people how to imitate you. We talked about this last week, right? And so 
as we help disciple people, maybe it's our children, maybe it's our family, maybe it's each other, that happens a lot, that grows and the depth of the truth grows. And then you start to see that the grace of God is growing in your life. The more the light gets into the darkness, the more that is revealed. And so we, we follow this right trajectory of Jesus comes and he dwells in our midst to reveal God to us in a way that we can comprehend. He teaches stories in a way that we can comprehend and understand. And then he invites us, adopts us, as children into his family. And then he turns around and he says, okay, now go. What do we need to go do? Make disciples. Not converts. Not chair sitters. I like to say pews, but churches don't typically have pews anymore. It's a good old day, right, where you all just crashed in together and now we're like oh if there are not five chairs between me and my neighbor it's they're too close we 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 start to love in new ways right and we we go and we don't just go and we go okay i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna teach my neighbor about jesus i'm gonna tell him all the things he's doing wrong and i'm gonna tell him a little about jesus no we we show them who Jesus is because of the transformation that he's done in our lives. And we let that pour out over time. And now we realize, oh, shoot, we're making disciples and we didn't even realize it. Now we're going to, we're working as your, your, your elders of the church. We're going to, we're going to give you some discipleship training over the next, give me some time, a few years. All right. Uh, I, I have, I have probably discipled uh, about 60 or 70 people in my life. Uh, it's an incredible experience. All of them different, right? Uh, some my I'm just good. men. All right, I just, one on one. I only disciple men one on one. I don't disciple. I would disciple lots of people in a group, but men one on one. But one of my things is when I, when I, if you're gonna come to my, I'm just gonna warn you now so you're prepared. All right. Uh, I will gladly disciple any men. I will take up all the time I have in my office. I'll figure out when to preach sermons later uh, to disciple men and my first thing I say to every single one of them that comes into my office, and this is, this is going to sound really harsh because it's meant to, I want to see you raised up to be just like Jesus, but I don't have all the time in the world. So if you're not into this, we're done. Now, it might seem harsh, but I, I want to pour into men, and I want to see them come to know Jesus in a, an amazing way, so then they can go and make disciples themselves. They can be witnesses to the truth. But we have to be willing. We have to accept who God is. Creator God, crafting the universe, stepping down into the world with intention and purpose, giving us life and saying, okay, now I I've made you this way, go use it. I've made you this way, go use it. You're a good teacher, go teach. You're a good relational person, go relate with people and show them Jesus that way. Maybe you you have the gift of evangelism and you can go stand on the street corner, right? If you do not have the gift of evangelism, do not go stand on the street corner. I do not have the gift of evangelism. But there are things that we can do as, as a body that we don't need to have the giftings for. We just need to be with each other. And so this is the heart and the grace and the love that comes when God himself enters into our presence. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what are you going to do with Jesus? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we can't begin to fathom what it means for you to speak into existence stars, galaxies, solar systems.
to create into existence from your voice animals and land and sea. We can't even begin to fathom, Lord, what it meant for you to create us and knit us together and give us roles beyond worshiping you. Father, but you, in your infinite wisdom, in your deep, deep love, knew that was going to be the case. And so Jesus came. And he dwelt in our midst. And he taught about God's grace and his mercy. And he, and he presented that, that, Father. And we are so, so grateful. And Jesus came to be the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have life and be known as children of God. And Lord, we thank you for that. And so as we embrace what that means, as we realize what it means to be a child of God, not just the inheritance, but the call. The call to witness and go make disciples, Lord, to help prepare us. Help guide us and lead us, not by our own will or our own flesh or our own desires, but let us be a unified church who is so sold out to the witness of Jesus that every time someone thinks of Washera Community Church, all they can think about is those people are crazy for Jesus. Let our words and our actions and our desires be filled with the Holy Spirit so that they are all about you. God, let us understand the depth and the nature of who you are so we can live to bring you glory. And so, Father, we thank you for your deep, deep love that you would send your Son, Jesus, and that he would come dwelling in the flesh, being like man, suffering a cruel, cruel death, willingly giving his life and using his blood to wash away our sins. And Father, all you ask for us is to believe. And so, Lord, we want to believe that. If there are those here today that don't, God, would your spirit speak to them? And Father, that we as a church would take that title and we would amplify it in a way that just saw more and more and more come to know you. So God, use us. Help us to know you more and help us to do your will. Father, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. No one has ever seen God. Lord God, we confess that we cannot stand in your presence by our own power by our own goodness. We can't even look at you. I pray that you would reveal that truth to us in a new way, that you are holy and in our flesh, we are not God. We are so undeserving and so much smaller, but you came, Lord God. <laughs> yes. Lord Jesus, you stand at the Father's side in his presence, you are God. And you came to us and revealed who you are. <laughs> you revealed the Father, you revealed the Son, you revealed the Spirit. We can see your grace and truth in action. We have been given access not only to see you, but to hear your words directly, to sense your heart. We don't have to guess what you would do if you were here because we know. I pray as we go, we would take full advantage of the access that we have, God, that we would be seeking to see you. You have graced us with your presence and revealed yourself to us. And we just have to look. We just have to see. Open up our eyes, Lord God. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.